Thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time. Uh, first, before uh, we teach this little Sunday school lesson, we'd like to give you the song leader that uh, travels with me in revivals and camp meetings and things like this, named Brother Ron White uh, from over in Chickamauga, Georgia. And I'm going to let him sing a song. And then uh, while he was on the cross, I was on his mind. And then we want to bring you the lesson on on how to die satisfied. Five men in the Bible that says that they died satisfied. Hope and pray, preachers, it'll be a blessing to you. May God bless you now, Brother Johnny. I'm not on an ego trip. I'm nothing on my own. I make mistakes and often slip. Just common flesh and bone. But I'll prove someday just why I say. I'm of a special kind Cause when he was on the cross I was on his mind He knew me Yet he loved me it was he whose glory makes the heaven shine so unworthy of such mercy. Yet when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. The look of love was on his face and thorn were upon his head. Blood ran down the scarlet road, stained it crimson red. And though his eyes were on the crowd that day, he looked ahead in time. And when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. He knew me, yet he loved me. It was he whose glory made, makes the heaven I'm so unworthy of such mercy, yet when he was on the cross, I was on his mind, yes, when on the cross I was on his mind I want to show you five men that died satisfied 
Now, how, what in the world would make a man die satisfied? What in the world, what happened in Abraham's life that said when he, he, he was an old man and he died, he, he, he died full and he was gathered unto his people? What happened in Abraham's life that would make him be able to die satisfied? Well, Stephen tells us about what happened to him. If you'll turn over to Acts chapter 7, in Acts chapter 7, let Brother Johnny show you something. In Acts chapter 7, before I tell you what, what boy, we turned over there. Look at Romans chapter 4 before we turn over to Acts chapter 7. In Romans chapter 4, the Bible tells us how to die, uh, like Abraham, how to die satisfied. He says if you want to die satisfied, you've got to follow in the steps that Abraham took. Look in, look in Romans chapter 4 and in verse 12. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the state and the steps of, of, of the faith of our father Abraham, which he being yet uncircumcised, but he was a Gentile. But it says that you, if you want to die satisfied, he says what you're going to have to do, you're going to have to walk in the steps of Abraham, if you want to leave this world, whenever you get ready to die, and they come to the to, to your hospital bed or your deathbed, wherever it might be, and you can raise your hands and say, Hallelujah to God, I want you to know I'm dying satisfied. What in the world would make a man be able to die satisfied? In Acts chapter 7, Stephen tells, tells us how that Abraham, why he died satisfied. In Acts chapter 7 and in verse 2, when Stephen is preaching to the high priest, there, he said in Acts chapter 7 and verse 2, and he said, Men and brethren, men and brethren, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was yet in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. I like that verse there where it says, The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham while he was in the heathen land of Mesopotamia, while he was still worshiping his idols. The Bible says that God, the listen, I mean, listen, Stephen put an extra touch on that thing. He said the God of glory appeared under our father Abraham. That's why Abraham could die satisfied at the end of his life. Do you remember the day, the time, the place, and the hour that the God of glory appeared to you? Do you remember that? Boy, I can remember that. It's just like this. It's been 30-some years ago. That night, September the 22nd, 1968, 9.30, uh, one Sunday night in Clarksville, Tennessee. Went to an old-fashioned tent meeting. Didn't go looking for God. Wasn't looking for God in a million miles. Didn't know nothing about God. But that night, the God of glory appeared unto me and showed me that I was a wicked, hell-bent sinner headed for hell that night. And that's why, that's why the Bible said that Abraham could die satisfied because there was a day and a time in his life that the God of glory appeared unto him. Do you remember that day and time in your life? Now, as I read you a minute ago in Romans chapter 4, now, listen, the Apostle Paul said that if you want to have the faith and die satisfied like, like Abraham did, he said you've got to follow his steps. The first step he took was forsaking his idols and this ungodly world. You see, Abraham lived, Abraham lived in Mesopotamia. They worship little false gods and false idols. The Hebrews, the Jews have a legend that says that one day that his daddy got ready to go make a trip somewhere. And he told Abraham, this is a Jewish legend, this is what the Jews believe. He said, Abraham, he said, while I'm gone, I want you to take care of all of my gods on, my, on this wall. And he had a whole bunch, the sun god, the moon god, and, and all these other different kind of gods. And they said that old Abraham was inside that inside of that uh, place there where all those gods was. And he picked up a stick and he began to beat those gods and to knock those gods and to begin to break them in a thousand pieces. And he said about that time his daddy come up and he he heard his daddy coming to the door and he took that stick that he was beat those other idols up and he laid it beside the only idol that was left. And they said that his daddy walked in there and said, Abraham. What happened to all of my gods? What happened to all my gods? He said, Daddy, he said, I don't know. He said, the only thing I know is this God here picked up a stick and killed all the other ones. 
He said, Abraham, don't you know that that's not true? Don't you know that that idol can't move, breathe, hear, and talk? He said, Daddy, that's what I know. But he said, by the help and grace of God, I'm going to find him that does hear and answer prayer and be able to save anybody. Well, I'm glory to God. It's good to know when the God of glory appears unto you. Amen. Amen. How? How could a man die full? A man can die full once the glory, God of glory has come. He can die completely satisfied once he knows that he's got peace with God and his sins has been forgiven and washed away in Calvary's flow. Isn't that right? How can a man die satisfied? A man can die just like Abraham. You can die so satisfied. Bless God, I heard here a while back up in North Carolina. Up in North Carolina, they said the, there was an elderly lady there. Bless God, I'm on to preach. I ain't on to teach. I'm on to preach. Amen. Bless God. But listen, they said up in North Carolina, they said there was an elderly lady dying in a nursing home. She had served in this church uh, for years and years. And, and so the pastor went to visit her. And, and he, when he went in her room, her eyes was closed. Her eyes was closed. And they said he bent down on top of her. And he said, Annie, Annie, is it getting dark? And she opened her eyes and she said, Preacher, shame on you. She said, The glory of God is just so bright I had to close my eyes. Ah, glory to God. I have to know that you can die satisfied. Amen. To know that you can die satisfied. Bless God, there's nothing like it, is it? To know that you've been born again. To know that every sin that you've ever committed has been washed away in Calvary's flow. Bless God, anybody can die satisfied like that. Isn't that right? Amen. Amen. Well, let's look at something else. Not only was he satisfied because he forsook sin, but not only that. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 12 and in verse 1, the Bible said that God told Abraham, He said, Abraham, for me to use you, I'm going to have to take you away from your folks. I'm going to have to take you away from people that you love. I'm going to send you to a place that you've never been, to a land that thou knowest not. Look at, look at Genesis chapter 12, please. In Genesis chapter 12, now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country. You notice here, it's Abram. When I read you in Genesis chapter 25, it's Abraham. You see, earlier after this chapter here, God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. You know why? Abraham got to pay in his tithes. You get to pay in your tithes. God will put some ham on you too. Amen. Amen. Is that right? Amen. That's right. Amen. All right, look at here. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It said, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I'm going to show you. So the first thing that Abraham had to do, he had, God said, Abraham, for me to be able to use you, there's something that you're going to have to do. You're going to have to get away from your kin folks. Now, there's a lot of folk I find in our independent Baptist church. They can't serve God because of their kin folks. Is that right? Is that right? They, they let their kin folks hinder them. And a lot of times, God has got to separate you. A lot of you folks sitting in this church and every church I go to has got some of your kin folks that's in the assembly of God, the Jehovah, the Jehovah false witness, and the, and, the, and, the, and, and, and the Mormons and everything else. And they try to pull on you. But what you've got to do, if you're going to follow in the steps of Abraham, you don't let nothing hinder you from serving this God of glory, the God of the Bible. Is that right? I bless God. Amen. I, you convert them over. Don't let them convert you over. Is that right? Amen. That's what I believe. Bless God. And so what Brother John so what he did, he said, you get away from your kin folks. Because a lot of times, your people will pull on you, and they'll try to drag you away. Because they don't never bother you until you get in the church and get saved and get right living for God. And then they'll come over, and the first thing they'll do, especially if they have the charismatic stuff, they'll come over and say, have you got it yet? Have you got the evidence? Have you got the evidence of, of speaking in tongues? Have you got the evidence of, of this and that and first one thing or another? i got a good friend of mine, i got a good friend of mine that pastors a church up in Nashville there, and he's got a bunch of deaf kids that he works with. And he said, do you think it's bad on you people that can speak and hear? He said, the, 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 the Pentecostals, the tongue talkers, all the time try to come to my class of my, my deaf children that only know sign language. So he said, I've taught them to, I've taught them to say this, yes. I'm sanctified, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, and i got the evidence of speaking with other thumbs. Amen. 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 So that's what I'm trying to say. They won't bother you. You know, I never, 
in 28 years till I got saved. I never had a church or a preacher or nobody ever been saved knock on my door. But as sure as that night that I got born again, within one week, every tongue talker, every Jehovah Witness, every cult, everybody come by knocking on the door. Amen. And say, hey, you need to get this, you need to get that. Listen, they say, have you got it yet? I said, man, have I got it? I'm so eat up with it, I can't stand it. Amen. Amen. I had it good. Amen. So first thing you're going to have to do a lot of times, you're going to have to forsake the world and make the God of glory satisfy you. Then a lot of times to follow Him, you're going to have to give up some things. And not only that, I like what the Bible says three times, only about Abraham. Three times the Bible says that Abraham was a friend of God. You say, you want to follow in the footsteps of Abraham? Do you want to die full? Do you want to die satisfied? Then the best thing that you can do to be in, in, in Oak Ridge in Clinton, Tennessee, is to be a friend of God. It's, the question is not, is he your friend? We, we know he's your friend. We know he's my friend. But the question is, are you his friend? You know, it, it was good, it would be good to know that God can look down from glory and say, I got a friend lives down in Clinton, Tennessee that I need to send to the nursing home, that I need to send to buy some groceries to somebody, that I need to go out and visit some elderly people that I need. I got a friend down there that I can really depend on. Wouldn't that be good to know? Wouldn't that be good to know that God knew you so good that three times that He said Abraham was a friend of God? Amen. Boy, hallelujah, bless God, I'd rather be a friend of God than anything else I know. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't it be good to know, bless God, that God could look down from the portals of glory into, into the Midway Baptist Church and say, listen, David and Paul and Peter and all the angels, i got a friend that's sitting on that pew down there, and I can call on them day or night, anytime I want to, and they'll do my will. Wouldn't that be good, bless God? No wonder you could die satisfied. I better get out of here. I better get on. I want to show you five of them that died satisfied. The next one, if you would, if you want to look at the next one, it's in Genesis 35. In Genesis 35. In Genesis 35, just a few chapters over, just a few chapters over, use that. Not only did Abraham die full, but in Genesis chapter 35 and in verse 29. Look at there, if you would, in verse 29. In Genesis 35 and 29. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and what? All of days. He died satisfied. That's the Hebrew word for full there. It means that Abraham died satisfied. How could Abraham, I mean, how could Isaac die satisfied? Because of the first place, if you want to mark it down, if you want to look at it, he was submissive. To his father's will. You remember his daddy's name was Abraham. His daddy is the very one that carried him to offer him up as a human sacrifice up on top of the mountain. Is that right? He was submissive to his father's will. I know that you see all these pictures of these doctor's offices. He was just a little bitty boy and his daddy was a hundred years old. No, that's not right. Abraham, Isaac was a full grown man. Was a full grown man. He went with his daddy obedient to the father's will to the top of that mountain. If you want to die a satisfied full life, you're going to have to be submissive to your heavenly father too. Is that right? You're going to have to be, if you want, if you want the, if you want to die satisfied and full of God, you're going to have to be submissive to the Father's will, whatever kind of sacrifice that He might call you to have to do. Is that right? I was up in Oklahoma preaching a while back. I was preaching on some things that you got to do before you leave the mountain. And I was using Abraham and Isaac and in my briefcase over there, they didn't know that that back during the night, I got me a big old bread knife. I got me a big old bread knife. I mean, it was a big one, like, like I'm sure that Abraham would have used. And I, that was a big old boy standing on the front row. He was about six foot three, six foot four. Young preacher boy, I mean, young stalwart boy. And I grabbed him to use him as a type of Isaac. I got him as a type of Isaac, and I laid him down on the altar. And nobody didn't know the church was packed. Nobody didn't know what was going on. And, and I said that Abraham laid his son and bound him on that altar. And then Abraham drew a knife. I went to, the, I went to my briefcase, and I pulled out that big old knife like Abraham did. 
That boy's eyes got about as big as that world globe there. And listen, one little boy went home and told his mama, said, Mama, you should have been at church this morning. Said the preacher pulled a knife on Brother Don, Brother James, and threatened to kill Brother James there. And amen, amen, amen. But I'm trying to tell you that Isaac says, I want to be submissive to my Father's will. And if there's anything that you and me need to be, it's submissive to His will. Is that right? Amen. Amen. Not only that. Not only was he submissive to the Father's will up on the mountain, but he was submissive to the Father's will in his marriage. Now, but I can lose about that. I wish I, had, I wish was preaching that. I lose about 99% of you right there. You see, Abraham sent Eliezer, the servant, to go pick out a bride by the name of Rebecca for his son. And a lot of you, a lot of you has not been submissive to the Father's will. You let your hormones get ahead of the will of God. Is that right? And you went out and picked out somebody that you thought was an angel and found out later on is Jezebel. Amen. Is that right? Is that right? But you see, the reason that Isaac could die full and satisfied is he let the Father pick him a bride. Is that right? See, a lot of times we get married out of the will of God. Is that right? And we wonder why 99% of them wind up in divorce, or if they even stay married, they're so stinking miserable. Is that right? Uh-oh. I'll shoot that knot hole for a while, but I ain't got time. I've still got three more men to go. Amen. But I'm just trying to tell you that Isaac, the reason he could die satisfied is he was submissive to the Father's will on the mountain. He was submissive to his will in his marriage. He let God pick him a bride. Is that right? Now, I know a lot of times when you get married and, and you're not saved and so like this, but I'm talking about saved folks. Listen to me, young people. Listen to Brother Johnny. You let Brother Johnny tell you something. The best thing you can do in your life is stay clean and pure before God and let the Heavenly Father send you a man. Let Him send you a man that will be a blessed husband. And if you're a young lady here, you might be the wife of a preacher or a missionary's wife. You might be able to, to be able to do something good for God. But if you look and if you get yourself ahead of the will of God, you can be living and carrying a baby, living in the projects. Is that right? Living on food stamps. Is that right? Because God didn't pick him, you picked him yourself. Is that right? That's the reason you look at all these men in the church. Bless God. Amen. They look like they're swatting a grove of persimmon uh, because they, they married to some woman there. Uh, is that right? They're so stinking hen pecks. Is that right? Amen. God can't stand a hen peck man. Is that right? Well, I guess I better get off of that, boy. I better go. I better get me another subject. Amen. Is that right? I was oh, I was I went shopping last night. I went shopping over it. I went shopping over it. I went shopping over in the oh, over in the well, K, or Kmart last night. And oh, while I was over there, I heard this man just bless out his wife. And I'm gonna tell you something. That, listen, I know of women. Just the Bible tells you husbands to love your wives. It don't never tell the wives to love the husbands, but it does tell you wives to be under submission to your own husbands. Is that right? This this outfit, this outfit there in, in Kmart. I tell you, he began to bless his wife out. Uh, she wanted to buy some uh, some kind of Christmas presents. It was marked a uh, 50% down. And I'm telling you the truth. He jumped on her. He jumped on her, embarrassed her before everybody. I'll tell you what, I felt like catching him by his jacket and slapping the fire at him and saying, Excuse me, Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm trying to tell you. Is that right? Me and my wife went over to this preacher's house one day to eat dinner, and we got over there, we got over there to eat dinner, and, and this preacher, you know, he's one of these real overbearing, you know, your wife's supposed to walk behind you, you know, all this kind of junk, amen, want to be the overbearing type ruler, amen, is that right? We went over there, and, and we got there for Sunday dinner, and, and she had a bunch of cold-cut sandwiches and stuff like this, and he took his hand, he raked it all off of the floor. He raked it all off of the floor. He said, when my friends come here, you fix steak, you fix some good cooking. You don't cook cold cuts, I have cold cuts and stuff for my friends. I thought to myself, it's a wonder God don't take a Holy Ghost baseball bat and knock your brains out. Amen. That's what she ought to do. She ought to wake and he goes to sleep and take him take a bunch of safety pins and sit and peel him up and, and peel him up in the sheet and take him take a broom and whip the fire out of him. Amen. You say I wouldn't do it. You I think you would too. Amen. Amen. You just like me. Amen. You just like me. Is that right? 
bless God, God give you a wife, God give you a wife, and God give you a husband. And it might not be the best looking thing. It might not be the best looking thing. They might be short and fat and bald headed and are tall and skinny, but they work a job and they try to take care of you to see that your needs is met. Bless God. That's the reason that so many of these women, they run around want to watch them taking soap operas, amen, so they can fantasize after somebody else. Amen. Is that right? Well, we get off the Isaac, boy. I won't forget him next time. All right, the next one is the next man that died full is in Second Chronicles chapter twenty-four. Second Chronicles chapter twenty-four. Let's look at him real fast. Second Chronicles chapter twenty-four. Second Chronicles chapter twenty-four. Here was a preacher. Here was a preacher, a priest of Israel. But something so tragic had happened in his life till he just let up. And he got to the place in his life that he wasn't serving God. He got to the place that, that, that he was not preaching the gospel. He got to the place that he didn't warn God's people. And look at here what happened. But I want to show you something at the end of his life. First in verse 15, Second Chronicles 24, 15. And Jedahiah waxed old and was what? Full of days when he died. A hundred and thirty years old when he died. When he died and they buried him in the city of David among the kings. Uh, because he had done good in Israel towards God and towards his house. Now, if you look in verse 1, there was a man that was made king there by the name of Josiah. He was seven years old. From verse 4 to verse 6, if you look there, this seven-year-old boy began to look at the land of Israel. He began to see the wickedness and the corruption that was there going on in the land. And this seven-year-old boy began to rebuke this preacher. Look at here what happened in verse 6. And the king called Jedekiah. That's, that's the one I showed you in verse 15. And the chief. Uh, and and said, unto, said unto him, Why hast thou not required the Levites to bring... Uh, to bring into all of Judah and out of Jerusalem the collection according to the commandment of Moses and the servant of the Lord and of the congregation of Israel for the tabernacle of witness. This seven-year-old boy began to rebuke this preacher. He said, Preacher, it's your fault that the reason that Israel is in the shape that it's in. Now, why could, listen to this, why could Jehoiakim die a satisfied life? Because when this young boy rebuked him, if you look at verses 9, 10, and 11, he called for a proclamation. He called for a great revival throughout the land of Israel that, listen, many folks got right with God. The house of God was opened back up. The sacrifices was made back to God. Why Jehoiakim could die was satisfied is because he could take rebuke. Did you hear what I said? Because he could take rebuke. Ninety-nine percent of our Baptist folks, all they want you to do is just like an old tomcat uh, that I used to have. You go down there, and as long as he's in here, as long as you rub him the way his hair lay, he was fine. But if you ever rub his hair this way, ah, I mean, that claws would come out. I mean, he'd want to kill you. Is that right? And that's the way I'm convinced about 99% of the Baptists are. As long as you rub them, as long as you hug and kiss on them, and don't tell the truth, amen, listen, they'll love you to death. Is that right? I'm, is that right? They'll even invite you to Shoney's. Is that right? You might even be voted man of the year around Clinton, Tennessee. Is that right? But I'm telling you the truth. If you preach a gun barrel straight, look behind me, cross your eyes like a billy goat, and I mean pin your ears back and tell the truth. That's God. They'll get mad and go off and lie on you. Is that right? But your Kai said this. Your Kai said, you know, young man, you preach to me. You see, the Bible says in Proverbs 9, 8, here's what it says. The Bible said, you see, I can tell what kind of person you are on how you respond to preaching. Because the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 8, rebuke a wise man and he'll love you. But rebuke a scorner and he'll hate you. So, in other words, when Brother Dunn gets up here and he preaches and he rides and divides the truth and he preaches it to you in a gun barrel straight, and if it makes you mad, if you get mad and rebuke that he gives you from the Word of God and you get mad and you get mad, you can never take rebuke and you'll never die satisfied. Is that right? You just take it. You just take it and say, God, I made the Lord convicted me of that thing, and i got to get that right. Not only could he take rebuke, but verses 9, 10, and 11, there was a great revival broke out. Then in verse 16, I done read you there. 
He died and he was buried with King David. He died satisfied because he was a preacher that at one time had not been right with God. But whenever that young boy rebuked him, he said, Young uh, King, you're right. My life has not been. I have not been warning of sin. I have not preached it like it should be preached. And I repented this thing. And he got right. And because the preacher got right, a great worldwide revival, a great revival broke out in the land of Israel. That's the reason at the end of his life, he could die satisfied. Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42, if you would. I'm trying to hurry up. I've only got a few more minutes. Job chapter 42. Who else died satisfied? In Job chapter 42, please follow me along there. In Job chapter 42, I want to show you something. In Job chapter 42 and in verse 17. In verse 17. So what does it say, my friends? And it says, and so Job died. What does it say? He died being old and he was satisfied. He died. What has God done so bad for you that you can't be satisfied? I'm convinced that 99% of the Baptists are not satisfied. You know why that? You want to say that? If they were satisfied with just the Lord, they wouldn't be running off all over the country trying to, uh, trying to get in all these seminars and all this kind of stuff. Every time God does something good, if God church prays for God or to give them a van, as soon as they get a van or whatever, then they go to praying for two vans. They're never satisfied with what the Lord is doing in their life. They gotta run. They cut. They're hunting. They're seeking. They're, if I can get it on a tape, if I can get it in a book, if I can get it in a seminar, if I can get it here or there, if I can run off over here and, and hear the perspirations, if I can run over here and I'll do this, if I can do this and that, I'll be satisfied. No, the Bible teaches us that, that, that and I have the cautions for more that ye are complete in Him. What Paul is saying, be satisfied with Jesus. He's everything that we need. Everything else is just... People say, if I just win 25 souls to the Lord, I'll be satisfied. No, you won't, because soon you win 25, you want to do something else. Christ is saying, be satisfied in me. You know why Job could be satisfied at the end of his life? If you will read, if you will read in Job chapter 1 sometime, he lost all of his crops, he lost his cattle, he lost his commercial trade, he lost 10 children in one day. I mean, he lost everything that he had. Not only that, but he lost the concern of his wife. He lost the concern of his wife. You know, it, it's hard enough a lot of times the battles that we go through. But you mad no men know what I'm talking about. If your wife ever turns on you and she tells you that you're a phony and it's not worth it and she turns on you, it's hard times ahead. Is that right? But if you've got a wife that'll back you and support you and love you and help you, Job didn't even have that. His wife said, Job, why don't you go on and curse God and die? We done lost ten of our children. We're spiritually bankrupt. We're bankrupt. We don't have nothing in this world. But I'm glad the Bible says in Job 14, 17, it said he died full. He died satisfied. Why did he die satisfied? Because the Bible says in all this, Job did not curse God. You know why Job could die satisfied? Because he didn't get bitter at God. Do you know that if you get bitter on God, that you'll never die satisfied? I preach funerals and stuff like this, and I had people want to know where God was at when, when, I, when I've done their baby's funeral or when I've done their husband's funeral or their wife's funeral, and they get bitter and they get hard at God. And I'm telling you, bitterness towards God, listen, not only will defile you and just destroy you, it'll destroy everybody that is in your family, your home, your friends, your job, your school, if you get bitter on God. Is that right? And in all this, Job never got bitter on God. I go out to Texas a lot, and I preach out there a lot. Out in Texas, out in Texas, they got these big cattle ranches. And you can go there in the dead of winter, like right now, just like this dead of winter here in, out in Texas, this big storm they have. I don't care if there's not a blade of grass out there. You can look out. Is that a time bomb? <laughs> oh, whatever. All right, well, I, 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 got, I know i got to go. Listen to this. And you can look out through this field when there's not a blade of grass for the cattle. There's not nothing. 
But in the midst of that field out there, there is an alluring little green plant that grows out there in that ground. That grows out there in that ground. I mean, it grows continuously year-round when there's not a blade of grass. And it puts such a, such a green allure off that if any cattle was in that field, they couldn't help but go out and eat of that thing because it allures to their eyes. And in Texas, they got this thing they call bitter weed. Bitter weed. Yeah, and they send these, and they send these Mexican guys that work on these ranches and these other people to go out there with a knife and they reach down. You can't just pull it or cut it at the top of the ground. You gotta get all the way down and get the roots out. That's exactly what bitterness does in the church. Is that right? If you get somebody with bitterness and the roots run deep, you've gotta get down to the root of the thing and cut it out and to get rid of it. But out in Texas, what they do, what they do, they take these, they get down, they take that root of bitterness, they have that root of bitter, bitter weed out, and they throw it in plastic bags. Then they carry it to the road and wait for the garbage trucks. Now, if you're out there tending your cattle and your pickup, and you're running your cattle and checking your land and your fences, when you get ready to come out of that gate, up under that truck, well, before it crosses up on the highway, it's got some kind of a sprinkler system. The minute that front tire of that truck runs across it, and you know what it's doing? It's washing all those bitter weed seeds out from under that truck. You know why? Because you can tear it down to your neighbor's house if you didn't get it washed away and clean, and some of those weeds by jumping in, going into his yard and hitting your brakes, some of them seeds would fall off under your truck, and it would plant a root of bitter weed in their place in their yard. You see, you see what I'm saying? And it's the same thing in a church. You get a root of bitterness here, you go to another church, or you get somebody to come from another church, and they got bitter somewhere else, they'll carry it here, and they'll spread it here. That's God. The thing to do is to cut the root of bitterness out. Is that right? And that's what they do with that root of bitterness. And they, and they wash it away so you can't carry it nowhere else. I know it's time for me to go. I'll just give you one more. If you want to, you'll find out whenever you study. Whenever you study, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I want to give it to you. In, in 1 Chronicles 29, 28, you'll find out that David died full it says that he died full, he died full, he died satisfied. In First Chronicles 29, 28, and it says, And David died being full of days. David died being satisfied. Why could he die satisfied? Because David knew how to fellowship with God. David, if anybody, I know that he was a murderer. I know that he was an adulterer. I know that David did some wicked, ungodly sins. But there's one thing you could say about David. God said about David, he's a man after my own heart. In other words, he said, David's a man that's got a heart just like me. David knew how to fellowship with God. I believe when, when, when old David was a shepherd boy, I'm going to close this. I've only got just a few minutes. When David was a young shepherd boy when the 23rd Psalm was wrote. And old David was out there tending them sheep. I believe old David knew sheep talk. I believe old David would hear one of them sheep say, You know, Elijah's my shepherd. Another little old sheep say, Moses is my shepherd. Another one said, Billy Graham is my shepherd. Another one said, Don Dunn is my shepherd. No one said, Johnny Campbell is my shepherd. And David said, you can have all of them you want. The Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. And that's why you can die and I can die full if you can fellowship with God on your way out of this world. Is that right? Let's pray. Our Father, I bless your name. God bless you. You're so good to us, Lord. I don't know why you bless us, spite of us, but God, you do. Lord, I pray, Lord, that folks leave here this morning. Lord, it has been good to be at the house of God. Thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. And if, Lord, during the remainder of this service, Lord, bless every song, every testimony. God, help me. God, help me. 
Lord, I want to be like Abraham. I want to be a friend. But Lord, I want to be like David. I want to have fellowship with you. Lord, I want to be I want to be like I want to be like Job. I don't want to be bitter at the end of my journey, Lord, when I get ready to leave this walk alive. Thank you, Lord, for letting me be back with these fine people. Thank you, Lord God, they love the preaching and the teaching of the gospel. Bless them real good. Bless Brother Don, Lord, is on his journey. Lord, may he have a good time, a refreshing a, a time, him and his sister, enjoying, enjoying the good things of God. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen.